I think the best word to describe the Goblet of Fire film adaptation is unfortunate. I've already outlined the difference between the films and the books in two videos I made last month, so I highly advise you check those out before watching this one, in case you're expecting a massive hour-long rant about how unfaithful and basic this film is compared to the original source material. For some reason, nobody really wanted anything to do with the fourth Harry Potter movie. Alfonso Coron went on to film Children of Men, and even John Williams chose to leave the series due to the bloke basically being the most highly demanded composer for Hollywood movies at the time. Not to mention he composed for four movies that year. It would be interesting to know if the studio's push for a Christmas blockbuster had anything to do with the overall quality of the film, but let's take a look at some of the finer details and decisions made within the fourth installment of the Harry Potter franchise. Spoilers are chock-a-block in this video, so there's your final warning about that, and if you haven't checked out my previous Harry Potter Did It Sucks, I highly advise you do that before watching this video. I normally start these videos at the very beginning of the film, but not a lot of people look at the DVD menus, as they are a clip of visual and auditory fusion just like the film. Now, I really liked the style of the DVD menus of the first three films, and I don't know if the DVD menus change between regions or different DVD editions, but on my Harry Potter 1 to 8 collection set of DVDs, this horrific opening sequence just makes me feel extremely ill. I mean, look at the goblet. Oh, it's just so gross. Why is the image in the window so stretched out? Yes, this poorly rendered CG fast really makes me excited to watch this film. Hmm, yeah. It's almost a sign of the bad things to come, isn't it? The opening of the film is pretty impressive. The dark tone of the scene adds an unsettling feeling to this rather confused opening. I would have liked a little more context for this scene to have been added, but I know that the Goblet of Fire is twice the length of the previous book, and not everything is going to be included for the length of the film. Having said that, I feel there are a lot of moments in the film that I would love to know why they were included when they had plenty of things that could have been covered, but weren't. When Nagini comes along to whisper some secrets into Voldemort's ear, I once again feel rather irritated that this whole past tongue thing has gone beyond just some weird vocal editing in the second film. It's so inconsistent. Nagini speaking in Parseltongue makes me wonder why the snake in the first movie speaks English and why the snakes in the second film don't speak Parseltongue. Fortunately, the scene redeems itself with a rather clever cut from a whistling kettle to Harry waking up at the Weasleys. The whistling sound plays out like Frank screaming mixed with Harry's scolding pain that he must feel within his forehead upon waking up. It's a really effective method of showing these emotions concisely and subtly. Even even if it's very dark and twisted, but I like dark and twisted stuff, so yeah, send me all your fantasies and forbidden porno tapes in the post to Pentonville Prison, Caledonian Road, London. So the start of our fourth adventure with Harry Potter begins with him magically appearing at the Weasley's house. As much as I'm quite happy this film breaks the norm of beginning with a Dursley sketch, I think that this raises a lot of unnecessary questions. How long has Harry been here? How did he get there? We are introduced to Cedric Diggory, whose character really never goes beyond, oh, he's a hot boy, from this reaction shot here, and nobody thinks it's a good idea to explain to Harry what the fuck is going on. He doesn't know where they're going, why there's a boot on a hill, but I would assume that being exposed to the wizarding world for over three years, you get used to just following what the locals do. The group walk into a rather comfortable looking set where some of the most irritating lines are delivered in the most irritating ways. Yeah, get out of the kitchen, right? Feet off the table! Feet off the table! I love magic. <laughs> What? So after all the excitement and build up for the match, Cornelius Fudge waves his wand to start it all off and then we're back in the tent? Wait, what the fuck? Then what was the point of all this build up? Where the fuck is the Wizard World Cup? Not only that, but you'd think that if you wanted the doom and gloom of the Death Eaters appearing later to have a really impactful effect, you'd show the match to contrast the following scene's tone. The film does a really poor job at this in its opening, however, as it feels so rushed. I understand that film adaptations of books need to leave out stuff for length, but seriously, this muddled arrangement of events feels so poorly edited together that it's almost like the film can't go five minutes without reverting back to the whole, this film is going to be dark idea, that I reckon the producer Users pushed for after the critical success of Prisoner of Azkaban. The sound design and dark aesthetic of the camp burning is really great, but makes little to no sense when you consider that there has been no mention of muggles being part of this situation prior to the attack. Why would Lucius and his friends go around aimlessly setting fire to the tents of potential purebloods? There might even be other Slytherins at the match that have no idea about the Death Eater's cause and are panicked out of their wits. The dark mark looks pretty awesome and accurate in design, and it's just a shame we never find out why it was put there. Two pumpkin 
past his place. Wait your fucking turn, he was here first! So Harry ends up looking like he's just attempted to steal something from the trolley, and then as soon as Cho disappears, he's suddenly not hungry? Why did you get up then, you lunatic? When the topic of writing to Sirius is brought up, I think another word to describe the movie is condensed. I'm not surprised, but obviously you sacrifice some of the most intriguing details that could have been included, but it stands to reason that every Harry Potter film prior to this one probably took longer than this one just to reach Hogwarts. Just looking at the previous movies, for example, it seems they had a lot more groundwork to cover before the meat of the story is handled. In Goblet of Fire, it takes them a length of 15 minutes into the two and a half hours of movie time for the characters to arrive at the castle. The parts of the book that were rather tiresome to read about, such as the sorting ceremony and waiting over two months before the champions arrive, seems to have been demolished with a swift stroke so that the tournament is the main point of focus, and I can certainly see why this was done. Spectacle. None of the lessons that are depicted in the books, except for the one Defense Against the Dark Arts lesson, ever see the light of day because there's literally nothing to see in them, and in my opinion a lot of them are rather pointless. When you can animate gigantic horses and carriages flying through the sky and a boat popping out of the water with such magnificence, you're sure to draw a crowd of idiots to come and see your film if it looks cool. Just taking a look at any of the trailers, we can see the main focus is on the four champions who have barely any character development compared to the books. The tournament, the dragon, the ball and the maze are never absent from any of the trailers either because that's basically all there is to this movie. Obviously as we go through the movie I'll identify whether I personally think this was the right decision for this movie or not, but for now we'll carry on with the arrival of the champions. In a previous video I described Filch's character as a bit disturbing, but this characterization is kind of thrown out of the window when he just runs down the Great Hall like a soldier being told to keep his knees up by the sergeant. What on earth is this part for? What have we established, aside from detracting from the subject matter, that the film has been building up until this point? Anyway, the bow battens arrive and... Spectacle, 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 spectacle. Spectacle, spectacle, spectacle. Spectacle, 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 spectacle. Spectacle! Spectacle, spectacle! Spectacle! We couldn't have Arthur breaking through the Dursley's chimney for this horse shit! <sighs> Fortunately, the normal cut of the film carries on with the story, but I remember mentioning this before, but there is actually a deleted scene of the school singing Hoggy Hoggy Hogwarts after the Durmstrang team arrive. Seriously, you can tell why it was deleted. The fact that the Durmstrang and the Bow Battens have just come in and impressed the shit out of everyone, and Dumbledore finds the most appropriate action is to sing a childish song? He even has this retarded magical karaoke machine flying above the staff's table at the front. I mean, what the fuck? What am I watching here? As Moody enters the school, the sky turns into a thunderstorm for some reason, and the kids all start screaming like they did in the first film. His entrance is pretty good aside from that little hiccup. I think the costume and makeup departments make him look pretty scary, and Brendan Gleeson was a pretty good choice for playing Mad Eye Moody. Note how I say Mad Eye Moody and not Barty Crouch Jr., because I feel the only decision that was made to make Gleeson behave and act in any way like Jr. was with that weird tongue flick thing that David Tennant does when we begin to see him. It just seems a bit obvious and lazy that there was no attempt at making the two characters blend together at any point during the movie aside from the tongue thing. And had Junior been portrayed like he was in the book, Gleason and Tennant could have had more opportunities to show off their capabilities and make a more interesting character. Our only lesson in the film begins horribly with a piece of dialogue that is just absolutely bizarre. I am here because Dumbledore asked me. End of story. Goodbye. The end. Any questions? Any questions? You just prevented them from asking any questions by saying all that jargon beforehand. Anyway, this scene is constructed well, but it feels very confused. Moody is not a bad character, even if his methods are rather extreme, and yet he is a dick to basically everyone in the class, with particular emphasis on Neville and Hermione, for no reason other than the script saying so. After class, the most ridiculous thing happens, right? The film takes an identical shot of this staircase and extends it before continuing. Seriously, this exact same shot is in both Goblet of Fire and Prisoner. How cheap is that? We have an extraordinarily cringy scene where some characters put their names in the goblet. Infamous attention seekers Fred and George then come along to have a go, but it all goes horribly wrong for them. This whole fight bit just makes me feel like Hermione does right here, though why she's not just sitting in the library away from distractions is beyond me. I don't know if I cringe because of bad acting or because of horrible memories of high school, but either way, I hate this because it's firstly not as it should have been portrayed, and I really don't know what the filmmakers were aiming for by 
having the two fight. It could have been hilarious if they just cut after the twins growing beards and all would be well, but it's dragged out for a stupid amount of time with pointless reaction shots before Mr. Silence comes in and puts his name in the hat. Why does this guy have so little to say in this film? In the entire two hours and 30 minutes of this film, he speaks twice. It's so strange considering the trailers make him out to be this big shot character who will have plenty of influence on the plot and is just pushed aside for horse shit like this. After Harry has been selected, McGonagall goes on another rampage about how Potter should stay in school nice and safe just like she does every year, before Ron and Harry have one of those interactions that just doesn't make sense to me. I find it quite irritating that Ron has so little sympathy towards Harry's situation considering if Ron was selected to be the champion, he would be absolutely milking it in front of the entire school. Don't get me wrong, it's interesting that Ron and Harry fall out here thematically, but god almighty, every time they encounter each other in the film, when they are pissed off at each other is just so cringy. Mainly because it's a battle of who can use the worst curse words for a 12A film instead of actual arguments. Piss off. You're a right foul git, you know that. To be fair to them, this is what moody teenagers are like, but come on. If I wanted realism, I would have just watched Freaks and Geeks or something. Onto a more positive note, I do think Miranda Richardson does a damn good job of portraying Rita Skeeter. Another great actress hired to play one of the adults in the story, as she has this gross character portray the nasty side of journalism extremely well. I love how she's such a mixed bag of characteristics. Flirty, disgusting, and considerably nosy. It's a brum cupboard. You should feel right at home then. To a point, winds Harry up so much just to get an emotional response out of him, such as incorrectly stating his age multiple times and just driving him up the bend. It's almost funny but also cruel at the same time, as if Harry hasn't got enough on his plate already and yet he's going to be publicly humiliated by a journalist who knows the game well. In the Owlery, Harry receives a letter from Sirius telling him that he should meet him in the common room later today. This isn't exactly needed and what's worse is the bird biting him afterwards. Was this meant to be funny? Another stupid line, just like, God, I love magic, that just fuels my irritations towards this movie further. I think it's unfortunate that the film misses out on the explanation of how this partial flu powder stuff works, in that Sirius is placing his head in the green flames on his end to communicate with Harry. I prefer the design of the fire communication in this film as opposed to the one in Order of the Phoenix, as it looks exactly like his face has been moulded around the parts of the fire, as if he has pushed his face through fire. Some confusing parts I can't quite make sense of, though, is why Ron does doesn't just peer over the top of the balcony part of the room to see where the voices are coming from, and also why does the paper catch fire here? Harry clearly missed the fire and yet it suddenly catches fire? Okay. Then we come to the stupid segment near the lake that probably could have just been cut from the entire movie in my opinion. The whole point of this scene is to establish that Hagrid is looking for Harry and Neville got given a book by Moody, right? And yet we have this tedious, nonsensical teenage garbage that's hashtag so relatable. It makes me want to claw my eyes out. All Hermione had to do was say, Hagrid's looking for you. And yet we have to make Hermione look like the oppressed one here? Why is Ginny even there? The annoying dialogue doesn't stop there though. When we go into the forest with Harry and Hagrid, it would seem that their dialogue was intended to be delivered as if they've only just started being in contact. The forest and their movements make it seem like they've been talking for a while, and yet Harry only notices Hagrid's hair just as they're about to see those big fuck off dragons. Malfoy then gets shrunk by Moody, which surprisingly happens a lot earlier in the book. Yes, it's no surprise really that the film made so many unforgivable mistakes considering the fan base's loyalty. Oh, Great. You know, I was doing so well without you, and yet here you are, right on cue as usual. Yes, I wasn't too pleased with your book review videos, Harry. It was over 40 minutes long of you just listing the differences, you moron! Alright, yeah, sure, it was a bit of a lame excuse for putting off this video. But hey, at least it's here now. Trust me, when I do Order of the Phoenix, I won't bother doing a differences video because the book was so bloody long and so bloody boring. <gasps> How dare you! The accuracy of teenage life is portrayed with such detail, how can you say that? Easily, because teenage heartthrobs and writing what every character has for breakfast in the morning makes me fall asleep very easily. Look, I'm not here to talk about Order of the Phoenix today, so I'm just going to, uh, carry on writing this script without you. Ha! 
I really like how the mystical objects in Moody's office are just passed off as weird things that will probably have no relevance at all, lifting any suspicions we have about Moody as he helps Harry identify how to beat the dragon. I love how the film compensates for not showing the bets that took place between Fred, George and Ludo Bagman at the Quidditch World Cup by showing them hosting bets on who gets massacred first in the first task. More importantly though, why the fuck is Madame Maxine's hair suddenly got blue highlights in it? I've looked on the Harry Potter wiki and I don't remember her having any blue in her hair in the book. What the fuck is this? Do you know what's even spookier? There is this shot of a CG model of her just peering over the top as Crumb picks out his dragon. It looks so awful. The Chinese fireball. Anybody else's souls rupture a little whilst watching that? In my opinion, the first task in this film is probably my favourite part of it. It's a vast improvement on the comparatively dull equivalent in the book, which feels like quite an anti-climax considering how hyped up the Triwizard Tournament was as the story had been described. The film's version is much more spectacular, which I may have complained about earlier, but this is where the strength of the film lies, in how large in scale the first task is, which is something the trailers seem to correctly portray. The scene is very intense, the dragon is animated absolutely beautifully, and the sound sound design for the dragon throwing Harry around in the first few moments is just fantastic. The fact that the film chose to show the unchaining of the Hungarian Horntail allows it to be portrayed as this hideously horrific dragon in comparison to the others. Presumably none of the other dragons pulled themselves out of their chains and so this change makes this fight more of a memorable experience for audiences and the characters who are watching these events unfold. The destruction of the school building as Harry tries to outmaneuver the dragons also demonstrates the potential danger in this tournament, making us wonder what other kinds of danger are to come for Harry in the following tasks. One small continuity error I spotted whilst watching this however is that when Harry is knocked off his broom he is seen falling leg first, but in the next shot Harry is seen falling head first on his back. <laughs> You'll never be able to unsee that mistake now. Oh. I'm so cruel. I find this whole section an absolute thrill ride of a scene and it's just great because no doubt somebody like Brian would have hated the fact that the dragon escaped from its chains just because that never happened in the books. After celebrating Harry's success in the first task, he and Ron kiss and make up. For some reason, Ron tries to explain the whole Seamus told Dean that Pavati fucked Fred shenanigan in the most confusing way possible, as if that shit kind of matters in any way to the overarching story. The replacement Colin Creevy called Nine Nigel then appears to give Ron a prezi and we have that ghastly scene where our characters learn how to dance. It's so irritating that McGonagall, of all the teachers, is the one to show them how to dance, considering how intent she is on making sure that everybody gets as much out of class time as possible before the ball in the book. This scene is just sheer cringe, it's so unnecessary and once again reminds me that we could have had that wonderful subplot with Dobby in the kitchens going on instead, but they chose not to and decided to spend a portion of the budget on that absurdly large gramophone. Speaking of the kitchen subplot, I've mentioned this before in regards to the connections between the muggle world and the magical world, but I'd really like to know where all the food comes from. I know it's prepared in the kitchens below the hall, but are there like magic food farms? Because the food looks pretty muggle-like to me. Bread, cereal and such, do the elves just pop into Tesco's and Hogsmeade and just pass it off as Hogwarts food? Maxine's hair turns back to normal and there's this really stupid deleted scene that once again I can understand why it didn't make the final cut. Three blokes nearly headbutt this group of innocent women and Harry and Ron look on aghast and confused about how to pick up chicks. There's also another deleted scene that's hardly worth mentioning where Harry tries to stop Cho to ask her out but is unsuccessful in even grabbing her attention. This doesn't build much to her character and is ultimately pointless as he asks her out later anyway. Then for some reason we see Snape overseeing our characters doing some work in the Great Hall. I'm very confused as to what is actually going on here. Initially it looks like an exam, as Snape and another teacher walk around as several characters do work. But then Hermione hands her work to Snape, Harry and Ron are chatting to each other, and it's not even exam season. Why are these students forced to work in the Great Hall? I've never seen the like in any other Harry Potter film. What on earth is going on here? Ah, uh, don't worry about this scene making sense. Just make sure the awkward teenage will you go to the prom with me cringe is enforced so nobody asks why the fuck there's an exam going on in the Great Hall in the middle of winter and why Snape is physically assaulting the students who don't study. I was just wondering if maybe you wanted to go to the ball with me. 
Oh, um, Harry, I'm, I'm sorry, but you're boring. You don't sound Nigerian at all. So go and fuck yourself, you fat little cunt. Ron then admits to showing his cock to Fleur. Just all slipped out. And then the ball begins. Fuck me, McGonagall aggravates me sometimes. She explains to Harry that the champions dance before anybody else, making me wonder what on earth those dance classes were for. You'd think they'd be in place to teach the students the formalities of the Yule Ball, wouldn't you? It begins, and I can't really say much about this part aside from the fact I find it very boring. Nothing, and I mean nothing, happens in it. There's a deleted scene of... Well, I can't really call it a deleted scene. It's literally the complete version of the Dance Like a Hippogriff song, which is absolutely disastrous. The lyrics are terrible, the music is poorly synced to the images, and Jesus Christ. I would say thank God it's cut down in the final cut, but st it's still fucking there nonetheless. The positive deleted scene comes along after this though when Snape comes along to slap some sense into those pesky kids. It's not only great seeing Rickman perform his usual moody ways, but works so well in his character's favour too. His only love didn't exactly work out well for him and it's unsurprising he would behave like this in front of the students who are showing love to each other. Not only that, but this introduces the subplot of the Death Eaters being summoned again and how much it affects those that have turned a new leaf and put that stuff behind them seen through Karkarov's desperation in this scene. It's the only part of this sequence that furthers the plot and it is just axed. <laughs> There's some squabbling between Ron and Hermione, and like I previously mentioned in my book differences video, it irritates me to no end that Hermione has a go at Harry despite doing nothing wrong. We begin to have a nice scene where Harry and Hermione discuss the latest gossip when suddenly, whoa, why did you just move to the other side of him so dramatically? This is such an odd movement. Why, who would bother doing that? In the bath though, things get very uncomfortable as Myrtle the pervert comes along to check out all the boys in the bath. In the book, Myrtle is nowhere near near as flirty or creepy. In fact, Harry makes a distinct effort in the book to make sure she doesn't see his private parts. And good on him. In the Chamber of Secrets film, Myrtle is annoying at worst, not creepy. Why is she like this? If Steve Close pulled his head out of his ass and actually had a look inside the books he's supposed to be adapting, we wouldn't have this bizarre scene occur. This scene actually makes me more uncomfortable than watching Lupin transform. What the fuck are you even doing? Okay, just stop. Stop that shit right now i thought these films were aimed at kids oh wait speaking of that 12 a holy fucking shit neville sounds like he's trying to sell the finest weed in the south farthing for an hour most likely most likely well there is some debate among herbologists as the effects of fresh water versus salt water you're but... telling me this now the second task is mildly interesting granted i would have preferred some of the finer details to be included such as the dialogue shared between harry and the mer people but it's not a problem as the visuals are pretty cool and the scene overall is quite exciting i think that dumbledore should have given all the people attending the event fair warning about how fucking boring this task would be for those on land as nobody is going to have a clue what's happening until the hour has passed the sound design makes the mer people and the Grindylows seem quite chilling and I think this would have been a prime time to show the squid under the lake but I think that probably would be asking too much considering the dragon and countless other things the film had to animate. Funnily enough in an early script of Prisoner of Azkaban the squid was set to make an appearance in the scene where Harry flies over the lake riding Buckbeak but I guess it wasn't harmful enough to create any real need for it to show up. I think the music in the second task is pretty cool it's certainly not as mystifying or brilliant as John Williams' score but I think there are a few of the compositions by Patrick Doyle that are certainly worth mentioning, such as the ballroom waltz when we see Barty Jr's face in the pensieve, and the third task's music's pretty swell too. However, I must emphasise that these are not masterpieces like Williams scores. A lot of it throughout the film does seem generic, and I certainly don't think I will be humming along to any of the tunes we hear in this movie anytime soon either. I'm not saying that the songs have to be catchy, but I wouldn't describe the soundtrack of this film as memorable either. In sheer disappointment of the outcome, we have more absurd when Karkaroff literally spits at Dumbledore for not giving the win to Crumb. Yet more absolutely baffling, nonsensical drivel that pours out of this movie's mouth. Harry then has a chat with Barty Sr. after achieving second place, which is actually part of an extended scene where after Barty fucks off, Moody tells Harry off for, well, being friendly with his dad. As much as I hate this scene for being stupidly obvious that Moody isn't all he appears to be, I can certainly see why this little snippet was cut. It would have made the obvious even more obvious that Moody isn't a good guy, yada yada yada, but obviously
Obviously, considering such a short amount of time passes before Senior is killed, there would be no second guessing who committed the crime. Funnily enough, there is another deleted scene that follows where Ron explains how much of an unliked individual Crouch was before he was killed, and that there will be many potential suspects. It's so sad that the whole Crouch plotline is reshaped and simplified in the film, and yet there are glimmers of this in this deleted scene. We had no idea who this guy was aside from the fact that he works for the Ministry in the film. Just the fact that nobody liked him adds a whole new dynamic to his character that we feel no sympathy for when we see his lifeless corpse lying on the ground, and I think it's a shame this scene in the common room wasn't included. The courtroom scene is pretty cool. I find it quite funny and reminiscent of that part in the Chamber of Secrets when Harry goes back in time into Tom Riddle's diary, only this time it's much more realistic, like an actual memory. The hand going through Harry's chest plays on this very well, and comes off as quite funny. I really love that big cage in the middle of the room though, it reminds me of the medieval torture coffins, only this time we can see the victim inside. This introduces the idea of there being some malpractice within the Ministry itself, and that torture is pretty much implied to be used in this period of time. Just as this great scene ends, Harry comes out of the Pensiev only to see Dumbledore standing next to him like a fucking spooky ghost! Why? As I have mentioned, some of the decisions in this movie completely baffle me. Dumbledore's not weird. He says some odd things from time to time, but what was the purpose of this? To scare Harry? What would that achieve? Snape's section in his little storage cupboard was absolutely fantastic as always. I don't think you could have picked a better actor than Alan Rickman for this role. I love how he just completely steals the scene in his outrage at the fact that somebody is going through his cupboards. I think the Polyjuice Potion comments that keep popping up are really subtle because they're never developed or paid much attention until now, which is the most appropriate moment in the story to do so. It was mentioned previously by Myrtle and obviously Moody keeps drinking something suspicious. It's nice because it's not too obvious, but it's still very much there for people to pick up on after multiple viewings. We do fortunately come to the final deleted scene, which is just total horseshit. I don't care what Snape thinks. I've got bigger problems than detention. Something's coming closer. I can feel it. So the third task is suddenly on our doorstep and it really does bug me that the film couldn't be bothered to explain why on earth the maze is just suddenly on Hogwarts grounds. In the book it explains that it was grown in the Quidditch pitch, but in the film there's nothing to indicate this. In fact the first shot of the maze shows all these mountains and things on the sides. Uh, where are we? I don't have any real problems with the maze section in all honesty. I know a lot of book readers were a bit annoyed that this section doesn't include all the little itty bitty moments of triumph Harry goes through, but I don't really think the Riddle Sphinx is designed for anything but literature. It has a really claustrophobic atmosphere that I can really get on board with as the cameras get right in the champion's faces and it's really fucked up seeing Fleur being dragged into the maze Evil Dead style before we're in the graveyard. I love how fast paced and confusing everything is up until the point where Voldemort is reborn because it confuses the audience to a point where the revival almost makes sense to the story. It looks messy but it is deliberate to make the audience just as confused as the characters who have been zapped from the maze to the graveyard. The ritual is brilliantly paced and the sheer confusion of what is going on bends the mind until the Dark Lord magnificently explodes onto the scene. The design of this body forming in mid-air is just so aesthetically pleasing. We see this body come to life but also gain shape and form. One question though, did the cauldron turn into his clothes or what? In the book he's given his robe by Wormtail but here it just magically morphs around him. The Death Eater's entrances are stylish and also suit this horrible dark and moody atmosphere with their outfits and anonymity. I certainly do think Ray Fiennes does a great job as Voldemort. I don't think it's absolutely terrifying or anything, but I doubt that was what he was going for here. He certainly pulls off the whole snake-like thing really well, but I think I would have preferred the guy from Philosopher's Stone. But then again, he might not have had the right appearance and you have to put a big name to the bad guy of Harry Potter, so it was inevitable, I guess. There's this really great tension between Harry and Voldemort in this part of the story that I really like, and that Voldemort knows how much more of a powerful wizard he is in comparison to Harry, which explains why he's so confident that he'll win. He does, however, want to prove this to all of his friends, as he invites Harry to duel with him instead of just outright killing him. His taunts are horrible and the situation seems hopeless, and yet Harry stands up, against all odds, walks out from behind the grave, ready to stare death in the face. It's a fantastic moment in the film that's demonstrated beautifully through the editing and low drums that are heard. Through some beautiful special effects, the pair begin dueling. I know a lot of people 
people find the way the dueling is demonstrated to be quite boring, but I rather like it. The duality of the colours represents their polar opposite personalities of good and evil, but it's unconventional as we normally identify red as bad and green as good like traffic lights. They were a magnetic repellent to each other, only now the only thing that stands between them now Voldemort has Harry's blood in him is their magical capabilities and willpower. Even stranger are the wisps of what look like some form of liquid flying off from the bright burst of energy that stands between them. It feels more organic than anything and it just looks fantastic. Yeah, there's not much to see but it's a battle that goes on mainly in their minds and magical abilities, beyond that of fast camera movements and raw violence. The tragedy that unfolds back on Hogwarts grounds is fantastic. The dropping of happy music, applause and celebration disappear very quickly after Fleur screams. It's really great. Aside from Cedric Diggory's father's melodramatic reaction to his son dying, this part is pretty great. Back in Moody's office, the slow and painful transformation is really intense and is a really great watch as all the pieces begin fitting together. I'm glad the film version doesn't give away absolutely every element of Barty's plan like it does in the book, but I think the portrayal of his character is shown more of an obsessive fan of Voldemort as opposed to a loyal servant. The teachers burst into the room just at the right moment and we have a wonderful show of special effects as Barty returns to his normal appearance. After reading this entire section in the book, it feels like Snape's Veritas Serum Potion was a tad pointless in the film as he doesn't confess anything. We know who he is because Dumbledore named him, so what was the point? The story of Barty Jr. is a sad one and it's an absolute shame they just threw David Tennant in there to be weird and crazy just to fulfil the criteria of a fanatic as opposed to a servant. What annoys me more is that there is so much horse shit in this movie that could have been thrown out so we could have had that storyline. I don't know, the film came out a year and a half after Prisoner so I don't blame them for missing out stuff like that. It's what made the series so successful financially. However, had they given the producers and filmmakers just a bit more time, I guarantee we would have had a more solid story as opposed to spectacle and oh yeah Voldemort's back. Michael Gambon delivers his speech in front of the school really well and I think this is the first time where I feel he strikes the essence of Richard Harris's portrayal of the character, taking his time with it a bit more, prioritising what is true over what the readers of the Daily Prophet would want to hear. He seems old here as well which I think was something that is glossed over all too many times with Gambon but here he absolutely masters it. Hermione then gets quite upset about the fact that dark times are ahead and understandably too. Now, there's a right way to respond to this and there's a wrong way that can induce cringe and make you look like the worst actor ever. Can you guess which way Daniel Radcliffe, the scriptwriter and director, chose? Yes. So, did it suck? This is, unless you nodded off for the past however long I've been rambling about this travesty of a film, my least favourite Harry Potter movie. And that's putting it lightly. I felt for a long time before I even read the chunky novel that came before this movie that this film was rather unnecessary and I still feel at many points that it is. We established that Voldemort has returned whilst passing the time with Harry being forced into these contests of endurance that don't have any relevance to the plot in the future. And that's basically it. The book version establishes so much more that makes the story that much more detailed and interesting and I think many will agree with me that it is the superior medium. This is not to say the film is completely awful, I can think of hundreds of films I would rather not watch compared to this, but considering the promising start of the first three stories created this feels like a bit of a stab in the back to anybody that loves this story coming to life on screen. I think one of the biggest problems is the script, the lack of any true detail in the film's story and the diabolical dialogue dialogue that just kills any form of enjoyment in this film, aside from the first task and the graveyard scene. There's so much that went so wrong in this movie and I'm very sorry if this is your favourite or if you think I'm wrong but <sighs> I give the Goblet of Fire film a 3 out of 10. The group walk into a rather uncomfortable, no, aside from the detracting from the subject matter that the film has been <laughs> uh. and had Junior been portrayed like this God damn it, this is a really long sentence. It just seems a bit obvious and lazy that there was no attempt to making those... No. No, I've lost where I got up to. Not his, he. Thank you. Right, now I'm gonna get it right. Should have had a coffee before I recorded this. 
I've never yawned. What's doing this is so strange. The whole point of this is to establish that Harry is looking for Hagrid. No, he's not. Hagrid is looking for Harry, you twat. The whole point of it is to establish that Hagrid is looking for Harry and Neville got a book given by... No! Oh, read! Read! And I hiccuped as well. This is all first. This is a first in two years of making videos for YouTube, if that. <laughs> Fucked up seeing Flair... Flair. <laughs> They were a magnetic repellent to each other, only now the only thing that stands between them is Voldemort, Harry, no, bums.